Hi, it's Sam Rowley here from HTTL, and I'm here today to show you how to photograph wildlife in the rainforest. A couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to work as a photographer for a beautiful eco-lodge in the heart of Madagascar's rainforest. This environment is famously incredibly difficult to photograph in, and I learned most of what I now know the hard way. Now, unfortunately, I won't be flying back to Madagascar anytime soon. So I'm here in London's very own jungle to show you guys how to best deal with whatever it throws at you. Photographing in the rainforest has undoubtedly been the most exciting habitat that I've ever shot in. But part of this excitement is the challenge. As soon as you arrive, all of your knowledge and skills are pushed to the absolute edge. You've come from a part of the world with a nice manageable climate you know your local animals like the back of your hand and swatting an annoying fly is enough to ruin anyone's day. Now, think of daily tropical downpours, hundreds of new birds to learn and every insect now being your worst enemy. Welcome to the rainforest of Kew Gardens. The first thing you will notice is the lens fog. As much as you try and wipe, it won't go. Until it does, your lens has acclimatised. You don't want your first shot to be all steamed up. When you first get up in the morning, leave your lenses outside to give them some time to adjust. And at the start of the shoot, always leave your lens caps off. These high humidity levels can also spell disaster for the functionality of your kit. I've heard horror stories of gardens of fungi setting up shop inside of people's lenses. To be on the safe side, there are a few things you can do to help prevent this from happening. Firstly, you can change your lenses at night when it's less humid. Overnight, keep your kit inside a sealed case with bags of silica gel and make absolutely sure that none of your kit is exposed to any rain. You can use plastic bags for protection up to a point, but pack them away before the downpour really begins. The rainforest is such a beautiful place to have the pleasure of working in most of the time, but occasionally this has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Darkness is your second enemy in the rainforest. In England, soft, diffused, overcast light is perfect for photography. However, in the rainforest, far below the dense canopy, the light is extremely different. There's not even enough light down here for most plants to grow, so photography isn't the easiest of tasks. Now, imagine coming across that special exotic bird you'd only dreamed of seeing in the wild, sitting right in front of you in this dark, horrible undergrowth. Our first port of call is camera support. Now, almost every other photographer would recommend you use a sturdy tripod as possible. However, I used a different technique. This is a small travel tripod that can only just bear the weight of my setup, but with a steady hand or a remote control release, it more than does the job. The reason I love it so much is that you can duck and dodge through vegetation quickly and get the thing up and ready in no time at all. Your next step is to think about camera settings. Thankfully, with camera sensor technology improving so much year on year, you can crank up that ISO to give you fast enough shutter speeds for sharp photographs, but without putting up too much to avoid excess noise. Another alternative is to decrease the F number down as low as you dare to bring the shutter speed back up again. With all of the above in mind, I managed to shoot this exotic bird of my dreams, this stunning male helmet banger with my travel tripod, lowest F number of my lens at F4, ISO 800, giving the bird a 40th of a second to stay as still as possible in. In an ideal world, I'd also have had time to set up my flash gun to bring out some truer colours and those dark shadows. Part of the wonder of the jungle is its sheer abundance of species, but this can also be its biggest downfall for us photographers. You're going to have a huge new bird, mammal and reptile guide to master. But I can't stress enough that you do. I found it incredibly helpful to know what to expect with certain animals. For example, my leaf-tailed gecko shots. As I was doing my research before I went, there are a few bits of crucial information that I came across. Firstly, I knew that they were too difficult to spot and that I wasn't going to find them by myself, I would need a guide. Secondly, I would have to take the time to go to a specific area where I know that they're much easier to find. And finally, and to my surprise, 
they're much bigger than I expected, leading me to use my wide lens far more than I expected. I could give you this breakdown for almost every animal that I photographed. Something that struck me as soon as I arrived in the jungle was how difficult everything is to see. Be the animal high in the canopy, obscured by dense foliage, a shy species, or even be insanely well camouflaged. You're going to need some help. There will be some local guides and I highly recommend that you use them as much as you can. I would have struggled beyond belief to find any of these perfectly camouflaged animals without a guide. In my photography, I always try to shoot for my subjects eye level. By seeing the world from their perspective, you get a much more personal photograph. Now in this country, this usually means simply lying down on the ground. But a considerable number of your subjects in the jungle will be way up there. Now sometimes there are pretty straightforward solutions. At lots of established rainforest destinations, there are purpose-built towers where you can photograph the canopy wildlife at eye level. But more often than not, this won't be an option. So you need to think a little outside the box. In the part of Madagascar that I was in, there's a beautiful lemur, the red ruff, which is found nowhere else in the country. My guide gave me multiple locations where I'd likely find them. One of them was perfectly located on top of a very steep hill, with the tips of the fruit trees in the valley below reaching up to the hilltop. It was here that I waited every evening for four days and eventually got my reward. I had the same problem with photographing the injury, Madagascar's largest lemur. My guide predicted when and where they would come down to the ground to eat some soil to help with their digestion. With both of these examples, it was all about my improvisation when I was out there. But if none of these solutions come about and you're not an accomplished tree climber, then I suggest finding a nice clearing in the forest so at least you get a nice good view upwards. I found that a nice quiet riverbank was usually a safe bet. I hope that I haven't been too negative about the rainforest. I want to reiterate that it's the most stunning and enchanting location that I've ever been to. A few pesky mosquitoes and what I've talked about today are a very small price to pay. So there you have it. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe to Nature TTL's YouTube channel for more videos like this every week.